Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. When you have it, say amen. amen. And the Bible reads, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. May the, Lord, may the Lord add a blessing to the readers, the hearers, and especially the doers of his word. And this morning, I would like to take for a simple subject matter, a kingdom heart. A kingdom heart. We may not realize it, but this is probably one of the most powerful parts of the Sermon on the Mount. This is actually the centerpiece of what we call the Beatitudes, of which we have two more after this. But I want us to understand something. This right here is the centerpiece. This is the most profound statement in scripture, whether we realize it or not. Now, some of these things that we've talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, you may think, well, they're not as clear. You know, I, okay, I see where you got that now, thank you. But this one here requires hardly any explanation. But there is so much scripture in the Bible that talks about this. I actually had to go through this week and I had to really work on bringing this to a point to where I could get it in a reasonable time. Blessed are the pure at heart. He says a powerful statement. They will see God. And I want to frame this for us because it, it deserves some context. I want you to understand why this statement is so profound. There's a condition that the people of God were in once again, as I've said before, when Jesus came on the scene. There are two systems in place that have oppressed the people of God. There's a political system. Well, it's the Roman Empire, of course. The Roman Empire has oppressed and suppressed the people of God. It's taxing them out of their minds. This is why the people of God didn't like the tax collectors. They were Jews who basically worked for the Roman Empire, and they basically taxed them to get their own income as long as Rome got their taxes. So the people of God were being taxed out of their minds. But then we have another system you may not realize, but it's even worse than the Roman system. But it's the Jewish system, which is the Pharisee system. The Pharisees, of course, they have worked into cahoots with the Roman Empire. They have somewhat of an agreement. This is the very reason why they thought they could be so slick in their work and say that they didn't want to persecute or they didn't want to crucify Jesus. But would you please do it for us, Roman Empire? They also had created a system of suppression and oppression. And let me tell you how they did it. They created a system of works. They took the law of God, made their own laws on top of the law of God so people would follow the law, and whoever followed the law of God and their laws the best, those were the people who they considered to be the people of God, but the people who fell short of what they felt was the glory of God, then they just pushed those people away. And people were looking. They were looking for the Messiah. First of all, they wanted political freedom. They wanted Jesus to come and politically free them. But I want you to understand something else. They even wanted even more. The Pharisees in their system of self-righteousness and elitism, and we are the ones, and we show you we're the best, they created a system of guilt. That the people who thought they were the people of God no longer felt they were the people of God. They felt guilty. The Pharisees made them feel like 
that if you don't work yourself back into our good grace, not God's good grace, but if you don't work yourself back into our good graces, and then we allow you to work your way back into God's good graces, then you are not the children of God. They created a system of guilt to where people felt like they could not be forgiven. Jesus said something about them. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. They were showy people. They wanted to show people they were faithful. They want to sit at the head of the tables at the love feast. They want to make sure they prayed on the corners. They wanted to make sure everyone knew who they were. They even extended what they called their phylacteries. They wanted to make sure that people would say the phylacteries are so big and they have so many scriptures in the phylacteries, things that they would either wear on their heads or things that they would wear on their wrists. They wanted people to say, look at how righteous they are. But I want us to understand something. Righteousness does not come from the outside, but it comes from the inside. And it not only comes from the inside, but God must put it in there. You want to know why this is so powerful? Think on it. Look how God has built this into the centerpiece. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Y'all remember that? I'm spiritually bankrupt. I have to go to God. Blessed are those who mourn over their sins. He says, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Then he says, they shall, those who hunger and thirst, they shall be filled with righteousness. God must fill us with his righteousness. And when God fills us with his righteousness, then we go out and show our righteousness through the mercy that we give people how we receive mercy from God. And notice what he says next. And then blessed are the pure in heart. Oh, man. Y'all want to know something that he's saying here that's so powerful? Because the Pharisees had done something that is inherently wrong in the eyes of God. They had created this guilty system to where it was no longer about being pure at heart. Everything was about an agenda. Let me help us out with something this morning. We must always make sure that we do nothing without an agenda, but only to do the will of God want to help us with something it's not about us being right I gave up on being right a long time ago you know why because no matter how right you think you are somebody will tell you that you're wrong I gave up on being right I just started saying I'm just gonna go with the truth of God you take it or leave it I refuse to preach with an agenda and I refuse to live with an agenda and I refuse to let someone make me live up under an agenda we must live up under the will of God, and our only motive must be the will of God and not our own. Amen. The Pharisees had created a very dangerous system, and the system was so dangerous that the reason why people started going to John the Baptist, you want to know why they were going to John the Baptist? They were glad when John the Baptist came preaching repentance. You know why? Because the Pharisees were not preaching a repentance. They were preaching, a, they were preaching elitism. You got to work yourself back into this. We must approve you. But John the Baptist came and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then when they started hearing about this Jesus, even more people start coming to this Jesus. And you know what the number one question was? The number one question of a kingdom heart is this. What must I do? What must I do to be saved? That was the question everyone had. No one had any questions on how do, you, how do you look like you? How do I pray like you? Sometimes we get the wrong understanding in the church. We always want to know all the stuff that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things unless first you have a kingdom heart. 
we ought to be asking, what must I do to have a kingdom heart? What must I do? And it's so funny when you think about the question of the day, what must I do to be saved? We see where various people started coming to Jesus and asking him the very question of what must I do? We see in Luke chapter 10, a lawyer comes to Jesus. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, he says, it says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, y'all see this? What shall I do? What shall I do to inherit eternal life, eternal life? Jesus said to him, he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Amen, Walls. You know what Jesus just told him? You got to have a pure heart. You got to love God first. Because if you love God first, it eliminates all of the agendas out of your mind. If you preface everything first with the love of God, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what someone thinks. It doesn't matter what someone says. It doesn't even matter what someone does. I must do it with the agenda of God. A rich young ruler comes to Jesus in Luke chapter 18. Look at what he said. It says, now a certain ruler asked him saying, good teacher, here it is. What shall I do? Are y'all seeing this? Some people are coming to get healed because they're sick. Some people are coming because they're hungry. But Jesus recognized something else in the heart of those people. It's not the stuff that they're really coming for. You know what they want to know? What must I do? What shall I do to be saved? He says, what shall I do to inherit e eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. Now, I want to help y'all with something, because a lot of people get this confused and say, see, nobody's good. Even Jesus said he wasn't good. That is not what Jesus said. You know what Jesus is telling him? You're calling me good teacher, but you're not calling me good teacher from a pure heart. You know why I know you're not calling me good teacher from a pure heart? Because you don't even know God, and now you're asking me, what shall I do? You know what Jesus told him? I know you have a motive. I know you have a motive, rich man. And I'm going to call you on it from the beginning. So y'all might not know how this goes. Sometimes when people want something from you, they'll try to flatter you first. It's like your children coming up. You know, I'm on a diet. My children come up to me and say, man, dad, you've lost 10 pounds. Can I drive the car with my friends to the skating rink? No, you can't go there. First of all, because you're flattering me and I haven't lost 10 pounds. Amen, Walls. He's saying something. I know your motives. You're trying to flatter me, but you cannot flatter me because I know your heart. He says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Are y'all seeing this? Y'all remember the story of the prodigal son? The one son goes out into the world and does all of this bad only to realize that father knows best. Amen, Walls. Y'all hear that, children? Father knows best. But there's another son that's been at the house, and he's been what he calls faithful. He didn't leave the house. He's been worshiping the way that he's supposed to do. He's been doing everything his father wanted him to do. But when the younger son repents and comes back home, the older son is mad. And he says, why do you bring out the fatted calf for him? I'm the one that's been faithful. You haven't bought out a fatted calf for me. I want you to hear something he was doing. He wasn't in it with a pure heart. He was in it for the recognition. I don't need to be recognized if I'm doing the will of God. Amen. The ones who need the recognition 
are the ones who have not been doing the will of God, and now they want to do the will of God. Those are the ones we ought to give the recognition to. Amen? We ought to give the recognition to them because now they want a kingdom heart. He says, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard this, look at what the Bible says. He became very sorrowful for he was very rich. Y'all see his agenda. I want to keep everything I have. I don't want to give up nothing. But I want you to tell me how do I inherit the kingdom of heaven for nothing. I'm sorry. To inherit the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to give up some things. And one of the things that we're going to have to give up is our pride, is our agendas. And it says, and when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men, amen, are possible with God. You know what he's saying? He's just telling the rich man something very simple. You got to give up something. You got to give up what it is that separates you from God to enter into the kingdom of heaven. I got news for you. All Jesus is saying about the rich man, he loved money more than anything. In every agenda he had, it was all about the money. But the most powerful illustration that we have is in John chapter 3. People love John 3, 16. I'm still so confused that people love John 3, 16 and have no clue what it's talking about. People have no clue what John 3.16 is really about. People will just blurt out, oh man, everybody who believes, anybody who believes in Jesus, they shall be saved. Uh, can, you can you just go back and read John 3, 1 through 15 so you can get an aha moment? Because people can believe in Jesus, they can believe in God, and never answer the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never answer the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have a cousin that says, oh, well, I know there is a God, but I don't believe in all that other stuff. I was trying to help him with something to understand. Do you know you wouldn't even know there is a God without the Bible? You wouldn't even know there's a God. You wouldn't know anything without God, but you doubt God. We have to help people to fully know God so that they can truly be saved. I want you to see something that Nicodemus does, but pay attention to Jesus. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, I want to help us with this right here. Let us make sure when we talk about the Pharisees, I know we talk about the Pharisees in a general sense. But Nicodemus is a clear sign that there were actually some good Pharisees. They had the right intent. They just didn't have the right teaching. They needed the right teaching, but they had the right intent. And Nicodemus doesn't just say himself. Nicodemus says we. He says we know. Well, who is the we? Because there's nobody there with Nicodemus. So he must be saying there's some others that share the same sentiment. But he comes at night, and I know why he comes at night. We don't have to guess on this. The Bible makes it very clear. He's a Pharisee, and he's a ruler of the Jews. He doesn't want to show a sign of weakness. The Pharisees have already placed themselves against Jesus. They've already staked their claim on, no, he is not the Messiah. We're not going to let him change what we have set up. We're waiting on the real Messiah. But Nicodemus is very smart. It's obvious from a biblical perspective because he sees the things that Jesus is doing. And he's putting, he's saying two plus two equals four. The things that you're doing, nah, you must be from God. We know you must be from God. But I want you to see something that Jesus does. Jesus 
knows the heart of Nicodemus. You know how I know? The Bible says Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, hold on a second. Can somebody tell me when Nicodemus asked Jesus a question? When did Nicodemus ask Jesus a question? What he says doesn't even garner the response that Jesus gave. But you know why Jesus gave that response? I want y'all to go and look at Nicodemus' statement and examine it. You know what he was really saying? What must I do? I recognize the signs. You must be from God. And if I recognize that you must be from God, I'm recognizing that you are the Messiah. So you know why I have come to you at night? Because I want to know what must I do to be saved? You know how I know this? Watch the response. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is used to agendas. He's used to, what do you want so that I can get this? Because this is the system that the Pharisees even have an arrangement with the Roman Empire. How do you let us do what we want to do and we let you rule over us even if we don't acknowledge necessarily that you rule over us? This is what they were used to. But you know what Jesus told Nicodemus? Not here. Not in the kingdom of God. We come here with a pure heart. That if we want to go to heaven, we don't come with our own righteousness. Are y'all following me? We don't come to God and say, God, look at what I've done. I deserve the kingdom of heaven. You're good, God. Now give me heaven. No, Jesus says, unless one is born again. But Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into, the mother, into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, I still can't understand why people can't see that water. They can't see that water is baptism. I don't understand why people can't see that. I don't understand why people can't see that that spirit, that spirit is the, the mind that God gives you through the word of God. God is the one who changes the heart. You must have your mind changed by God if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Boy, Jesus told him something. You are going to have to have your mind changed before you enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't come in here with that mind. You can't come in here with a corrupt mind. You come in with the mind that God gives you. And Nicodemus answered him and said, how can these things be? Jesus answered him and said, are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we see and you do not receive our witness. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man must be lifted up that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Are we seeing this? Now this statement makes sense. If you believe you will have your mind changed by God through the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Amen, walls. If you want to be saved, you must repent. You hear what Jesus just told him? You must be born from water and the spirit. Your, your mind must be changed. You need to have a pure heart. A kingdom heart is what's needed to be saved. The kingdom heart is pure. 
Jesus just told Nicodemus something, and Jesus kept telling everyone the same thing. I know what y'all used to. All of these systems have been created. I want y'all to understand, there's only two systems. There's only the system that man has created and the system that God has created. Those are the only two systems. I don't care if church is even involved in man's system. If man has let the system of man enter into God's system and corrupted it, that's not even God's system any longer. That's man's system. God don't mix the world with the church. That's not what God does. The church is the light of the world. The church is the one who is supposed to influence the world. The world doesn't influence the church. And so God is saying something. The standard is the pure heart that comes from God. And I want you to think about what people do. This is what man does. Man creates this standard. I'm going to find somebody lower than me. And I'm going to show how much better that, that I'm going to show how much better I am than they are. So the people will choose me over them. That's what man does. You realize this is what people do? I don't care if they want to get elected to a, a, a birthday planning committee. The person who wants to plan the birthday party wants to show all the accolades. Well, let me tell you about me. I've actually planned about 50 birthday parties. And the person who's asking to do this against me, they've never even planned a birthday party. And what do people have a tendency to do? Well, this person right here has planned 50 birthday parties. Probably can't plan a birthday party from no, from the front to the back. But we'll choose those people. What do we do? We choose them because we think they have experience. And it is good to get people who have experience. But the issue becomes when we talk about the word of God and entering into the kingdom of heaven, all of those systems, they go out the window. The pure heart is the standard. The heart that's been changed by God is the standard. And that's why God told the Pharisees. He says, look, blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside of them may be clean also. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. God was saying something about them. Man, y'all really showy. Y'all can show a good game, but y'all are not a good game on the inside. Do y'all really know what a whitewashed tomb was all about? Basically, what they would do is when they wanted to bury a body of somebody, the Jews didn't want to be uh, defiled by touching anything of a dead body or touching anything that a dead body had touched. So you know what they would do? They would get white paint. And they would make sure when they use a tomb so that they don't be defiled by what was in it previously, well, they would just whitewash it. It's painted white. So when the people would come in, they'd go, oh, it's clean. Uh, in reality, it's not clean. It's just white paint over a dirty tomb. And that's what Jesus was saying about them. Because we have to understand that pure in the sense of the Bible means that God is the one who has made the person pure. Pure means cleansed. Pure means from a biblical perspective, without an agenda, without a motive, other than what shall I do to be saved? And so this is the issue that, that David said in Psalm 5150. This has to be one of the most powerful Psalms in the Bible. David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Because David started to understand something about the heart if it's not cleansed by God. The heart is wicked above measure without God thrown into the mix. This is why I'm always, I tell people this all the time, please stop telling people that God knows your heart. Because without God, how can your heart be good anyway? 
But even when we look sometimes at people and we say, well, they'll say, well, God knows my heart. I say, I wouldn't even tell anyone that because, yes, he does know your heart. I'm going to tell you something. I don't always have the right thoughts in my mind. So I don't tell people that God knows my heart. I know God knows my heart, and I'm thankful for his grace and mercy because he knows my heart. But the Bible is saying something about the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is not talking about the muscle in our chest. He's talking about the thing that's in our head. This is where everything takes place first. It starts here and then it works itself out of the body. But the pure heart is made pure by God and God alone. Ezekiel said in, in Ezekiel 36, 25, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Jeremiah 32, 39 says, then I will give them one heart in one way. They may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. James 4, 8 says, look. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Look at this, church. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. God is just saying something very simple. We got to be with him with no motives and no agenda because the kingdom heart transforms. Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Because a person with a kingdom heart will see God. Let me tell you all something. We got so much Bible now. Man, we've heard so many sermons. Good sermons, bad sermons, in between sermons. We've heard it all. Bible study and all of this stuff. We all believe in God. But we're going to have to learn how to get excited about God again. I'm sorry. We're going to have to learn how to get excited about the Lord. And we're going to have to learn how to be lifted by the word of God. Because I'm going to tell you something that got these people real giddy. When Jesus makes a powerful statement and says, blessed are the pure in heart. You want to know what got them giddy? When he said, they shall see God. Can I help y'all for a second? We ought to be saying hallelujah and amen right now. Do y'all know that Jesus said no one has ever seen God? No one has ever seen him. But the saved... Do y'all know we're going to get an opportunity to do something that no one has ever gotten the opportunity to do? We're going to get to see God. And some people, you know, some people were saying stuff like this. I remember when I was young, people would say, well, you know, that particular scripture right there is telling us something. That there are going to be some people, they're going to go to heaven, they're not going to see God. Only the people that are pure at heart, pure at heart. So you can go to heaven without being pure at heart? Well, you know, you can go to heaven with some imperfections. But those who are really good, they're going to get to see God. No, I got news for all of us. If you are saved, you are the pure at heart. And you are going to get the opportunity of a lifetime you are going to get to see God. I'm sorry. That ought to have us giddy. Amen. We ought to have a hop in our step. We ought to be skipping, and people ought to be asking us, well, what are you so happy about? Because I'm going to get to see God. Amen. Amen. We ought to be happy about that. And they are giddy about this. Wait a minute. You're telling me that the standard is all I need is a pure heart. I don't have to work my way into the Roman political system. I don't have to work my way up to the Pharisees. You're telling me if I repent with a pure heart, I get to see God? Yes, you do. And nobody can take it away from you. Isn't it powerful? No man can see God and live. 
In Exodus 30, 33, 20, when Moses asked to see God, he said, but he said, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. Do y'all know we're going to see God and live? We're going to see God because he lives and we live through him. He says, look, let me tell you something. People don't realize something about Job. Job was foreshadowing the New Testament at every turn. Job said in Job 19, 26, when Job is so distraught because his health and his, his health is so bad and he's got this issue with his skin and no one can figure out why. Job doesn't know that God has told the devil, have you tested my servant Job? I bet you Job wish he could have been in that conversation, don't you? But watch what Job says in his faith. Job says, and after my skin is destroyed, he said this, I know. Tell me this is not mind boggling. That in my flesh, I shall see God. What? Moses says, we believe that the book of Job is one of the first books of the Old Testament. And even back then, Job is saying, that when I am resurrected, are y'all following this? Even if I die, when I resurrect, I will see God. Amen, Walls? This kind of thinking goes even back to Job. And I believe that people probably had forgotten it, but Jesus now reminds them, if you have a pure heart, you shall see God. Amen? And I'm going to leave you with this. I, I, I can't leave this out. First John chapter 3. Behold, verse 1, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. See, this is what's wrong with the church. We don't look at this stuff any longer and go, wow, I'm a child of God. We let people take that away from us. We let people take those shout moments because people in the world say stuff like, man, you know what? I'm a child of God and don't even know him. No, we know him. We are the children of God. We ought to be giddy about this stuff. Look at what he says. He says, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For look at this church. We shall see him like he is. Man, I had an old preacher told me. He said, George, I'm sorry. That scripture brings tears to my eyes. He said, that's my favorite scripture in the whole Bible. Why? He said, George, because I'm going to see God. I'm going to see him as he is. He says, look, and everyone who has this hope in him, church, purifies himself just as he is pure. Amen, Walls. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want to talk about a faith builder? At people who had had their faith destroyed? This was a faith builder. When Jesus said, you shall see God, it is a guarantee. It was a faith builder. If we want to be saved, church, we must repent. We must turn from the world and turn towards God. I don't know about you. But if the incentive of seeing God face to face doesn't make you want to turn from the world and turn towards God, I don't know what will. You can tell me anything you want to. People can threaten your life. But if that don't make you want to turn around, what will? If we want to be saved, church, we must confess that Jesus is the Son of God, meaning he is the Lord of our life, meaning he has purified our hearts. Then we are baptized for the remission of our sins. See, this is why we got to start helping people with this. I remember the first time I got baptized. I mean, really baptized, not the one to marry my wife. I mean, the real one. I cried. I cried because I realized what I had done. I had gave my life to Christ and he had washed away all my sins. And all the things that people were holding against me, they could no longer hold it against me, church. And that's how we ought to be. This is why this stuff ought to make us excited. 
It ought to make us excited. If you are here today, if you have not answered the gospel of Jesus Christ, you should do so today because you should feel this same happiness. And for those of us in the church, I'm sorry, but we got to start being more excited about the Lord because we are going to see God as we stand and sing the song of invitation.